as you heard in the video, Allah is not the name of a unique Islamic God, but rather the general term for God in Arabic. Um, and in fact, uh, it is also used specifically by Christians, by Jews, and by others as well, um, in including certain expressions that are often demonized uh, when we talk about them, like Allahu Akbar, which simply means God is great, uh, or inshallah, God willing, uh, and others like that. You see an archbishop here, a uh, Christian, who specifically uses these phrases as well, because again, the word is simply the word for God. And Muslims share the same concept of God as the divine creator that is kind and merciful and wants humanity to live moral lives and help each other and do good. And also, if you think about something, the concept of different gods goes against the concept of monotheism, which is the belief in one God. And I want to also point out that you might hear Muslims use the word Allah when talking about God, even in a sort of a setting where they're speaking English, because of certain things that the word Allah is very unique. It can't be made plural. It can't be genderized. Uh, it can't be, you know, applied to other things. It is very unique. So that's why uh, some prefer to use the word Allah, even when speaking in English. But having said that, Islam really teaches respect for other faith traditions and teaches that revelation came to prophets and messengers throughout history. In fact, according to one saying of Prophet Muhammad, uh, there was something like 124,000 prophets who were sent throughout history to humanity, teaching us the same essential message of monotheism of worshiping the one true creator God and doing good to his creation. But we as human beings just kept getting it wrong. That's why there was this need for constant, you know, sending more and more people. And the Quran specifically mentions 25 prophets by name and 21 of those prophets are ones that are also mentioned uh, in the Bible. Some of the names might be slightly different in the Arabic form, like uh, Musa instead of Moses or Nuh instead of Noah, but they are the same individuals and the stories are similar, even if there are some, uh, some differences in some of the stories. Now, Muslims also believe in the prior revelation given to such prophets, like the Torah or Ten Commandments to Moses, peace be upon him, the Psalms to David, peace be upon him, the Injil or Gospel to Jesus, peace be upon him. And this message of believing in the prior prophets and the prior revelation is repeated throughout the Quran in several different places. You see this sort of message in the Quran telling Muslims to believe, to say that we believed in God and what was revealed uh, previously to the different prophets, and also specifically there's an insistence that, you know, there's these different verses uh, in chapter three of the Quran, chapter two of the Quran has it, uh, another one here as well. But there's a specific message, this insistence that Muslims should not differentiate among the different messengers of God, because each prophet was sent by God with sacred guidance, we are taught, and the essential message of each one was the same. This is the continuity of one unified message that Islam teaches. And the Quran is, is presented, is told as a confirmation of what was sent before, of the truth before, is the way the Quran describes it here in chapter three, verse three, that God has sent Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming what was before it. Uh, and he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime as a guidance to the people. Now, again, you don't have to believe any of this, but it's important to know what Islam teaches and what Muslims believe about other revelation and other prophets, including those from various faith traditions. Now, the teachings of prior messengers we are taught in Islam and the, the prior prophets, they were sent to specific communities or specific nations, whereas the revelation of Muhammad, given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, is considered um, universal. And it was enshrined in the Quran. And that's why in Islam, he is considered the seal of the prophets or the final one, and no prophets were sent after him. Now, much of Islamic moral teachings are also similar to that of other faith traditions and wisdom traditions. Um, Islam, like other major religions, teaches compassion and charity toward people in need. Basically, the golden rule, as you can see here on the screen, that exists in various wisdom traditions. For Islam, what's listed here is one of the repeated teachings of Prophet Muhammad that none of, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. And Muhammad also said things like, whoever wishes to enter paradise should treat people as he or she wishes to be treated by them. 
again, that concept of the golden rule. And there are many other teachings like this about caring for others, loving your neighbors, and simply treating people well, regardless of their background. The Quran and Muhammad further spoke of Jews and Christians as people of the book. Now, this is an honorific title that's used, and it's a recognition, again, that they are fellow believers with revelation given to messengers sent to those communities. Now, some say this term, people of the book, this honorific title, also applies to others who were given revelation. And Islamic rulers in Persia and India, according to some, later expanded that term to include adherents of Zoroastrianism and Hinduism um, and, and things like that. Now, besides the concept of God, the chain of prophets bringing a unified message, the similar moral teachings that we see, and much more, there are certain specific commonalities with Judaism and Christianity in particular that I want to point out because they are part of the Abrahamic faith traditions. And we say Abrahamic faith traditions because of the common patriarch, Abraham, prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. There are things like when, when Muslims do the spiritual pilgrimage to, to Mecca, they actually follow in the footsteps of Abraham and his wife, Hagar, not Muhammad, which is a surprise to some. We, we close every prayer as Muslims, we close every single prayer by seeking peace and blessings that God granted to Abraham to also apply to people today. So it's a constant recognition of that connection to Abraham. And then Moses, peace be upon him, he's actually the most often mentioned person in the Quran, far more than Muhammad or anybody else, peace be upon all the prophets. In fact, there's a prayer that Moses taught us that's recorded in the Quran uh, that he was uh, that he used when he went to go uh, approach Pharaoh and speak to Pharaoh. And that prayer is something that Muslims even to this day repeat before we do sort of things like public speaking. It's a prayer I repeated before I started here, for example. And we're also grateful to Moses because he actually is the one who's responsible for shortening our uh, daily prayers to, to only five. Because originally the story goes, it was God had said 50. And in this night journey that Muhammad had, he met with different prophets, including Moses. And Moses is the one who told Muhammad, go back to God and negotiate that down because 50 is too much, your people can't do it. So he got down to 40. He said, no, 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 go back. That's still too much, down to 30, down to 20, 10 finally got down to five uh, with Muhammad going back and forth based on uh, Moses's encouragement and uh, recommendation until at five, he was just like, I, I, I can't go, go back anymore. This is too much. You know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to go back. Five is, is too little. So that's why we have the five daily prayers. Um, in any case, with uh, Beyond Moses, there's also connection specifically with Jesus, peace be upon him. He is revered as one of the greatest men to have walked this earth for Muslims. Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself described uh, Jesus and him, the sort of final two prophets, as the closest. You know, if you think about this whole big family of prophets sent to humanity throughout the course of history, Jesus and Muhammad sort of are the, the youngest, the final two, according to Islamic teachings. So, that, so he actually described himself and Jesus as tight like this, like two fingers close to each other. And Jesus is actually mentioned the exact same number of times as Adam is mentioned in the Quran with the idea of being that they're both created sort of miraculously. The Quran further describes specifically the miraculous birth of Jesus and the miracles he performed, including ones not mentioned in the Bible, like sitting in his cradle, um, even as a baby to defend his mother. So the Quran specifically recognizes and talks about Jesus as the Messiah even, and we're taught that he will return in the second coming to defeat the Antichrist. Uh, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon them both, has a chapter named after her in the Quran, chapter 19. She's spoken of as a model for women everywhere. The Quran specifically states in chapter three, verse 42, and mentioned when the angel said, oh Mary, indeed God has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the world. So she's really exalted in Islamic teachings. Now, there are some major differences, of course, between Islam and Christianity. Uh, for instance, you know, Muslims do not believe in the divinity of Jesus or the concept of the Trinity or original sin uh, or uh, the fact that, uh, or, 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 you know, the crucifixion, uh, can't even talk, or the crucifixion of Jesus, peace be upon him. This, and these are major differences. I'm not undermining them in any way. But despite those theological differences, the Quran does talk about the fact that, you know, salvation is for Jews and Christians and others beyond Muslims as well. 
For example, the Quran repeats the message that any of you who believe in God and do righteousness shall get their reward. And not just in this world, but also in the hereafter. And part of what's really emphasized, as you heard in the video, um, in Islamic teachings is freedom of choice. It is so very important. The Quran is explicit about allowing individuals to choose whether to believe or not to believe. For example, it states in one verse, the truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. And one way of understanding the Islamic view of religious freedom is to look at the role of prophets and messengers. Even they, with a special unique role that they played, even they were not sent to impose their will on others. The Quran, in fact, states this several times through the, uh, throughout, uh, like in chapter 28, verse 56, where the Quran says, indeed, O Muhammad, you do not guide whom you like, but God guides whom he wills, and he is the most knowing. So even the prophets couldn't sort of impose their will on others. And the, the point is that religion itself cannot be forced on anyone. As you heard in the video, the specific verse about let there be no compulsion in religion. You know, that, that it has to be a choice. And why is that so important? It's, it's important to keep in mind that in Islam, this life is seen as a test. And you cannot have a true test of faith in this life without religious freedom, without the freedom of choice, without getting to make, you know, have free will and exercise that will because this life is a test for us, we are taught. In fact, one of the main reasons that God uh, eventually allowed that defensive struggle of jihad that we talked about in a previous session was specifically to preserve and protect the freedom of religion and ensure that there is no religious persecution. This is so important. And in fact, in Islam, we are taught that the various differences that we have in our various religions, that's actually part of the test here on earth. God even tells us that he, in the Quran says that he could have made us all united in one religion. He could have just had one religion and everybody chooses or chooses not to believe in that. But he actually wanted to test us with these differences. And the specific command here is, out, you know, the command to us is to race to all that is good. That's what the sort of the emphasis is. And leave, you know, when we return to God, God can sort out our theological differences. But our commandment, our goal, our efforts should be striving to do good while we are here on earth. And in fact, one chapter of the Quran, chapter 109, is specifically all about allowing people to follow their own religion, whatever they choose to follow. You know, it specifically directs us to say, I, I do not worship what you worship, nor do you worship what I worship. You have your religion and I have mine. Very simple, very clear. And the, uh, the Quran also even gives specific guidance for how to do sort of interfaith dialogue, right? There's a, a verse in the Quran that specifically directs us to find commonality, to come to a common word between us. And, and the common word with people of the Abrahamic faith traditions is that we all worship one God or people of sort of monotheistic traditions is that we all worship one God with no partners. Right, and if they turn away, then just say, okay, we're still gonna believe in just one God. And then we are also explicitly told in the Quran as well, not to argue with the people of the book, except in a way that is best. So the dialogue should be productive, not name calling, not attacking, not con you know, condescending or putting people down. In fact, we're taught to say, we believe in what has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one. And we are Muslims in submission to God. These are some of the specific teachings of the Quran that are oftentimes ignored or not even understood or known to exist for a lot of people who don't know much about Islam. And as you heard in the video, and I know we talked about before, Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he faced persecution and he understood the importance of religious freedom. The Muslim community in Mecca was facing torture while they were there. There were multiple assassination attempts on Prophet Muhammad, and the community didn't have religious permission yet to even fight back in self-defense. They had to flee the persecution in Mecca, and they were invited, Muhammad was specifically invited to Medina by the warring tribes there to essentially be a peacekeeper and a sort of a leader, to bring peace there. And when he escaped to Medina, 
he established what you heard uh, in the video, which was an agreement, a constitution with the Jewish and Arab uh, tribes who were there. And this is described uh, as some by one of the earliest or even the first written constitution, the Medina Charter in the year 622. And this Medina Charter, it contained 47 clauses and specifically included guaranteeing certain rights like religious freedom. You don't have to look at all of this, but this is kind of get, goes into uh, what, what provisions apply to all the citizens of Medina, which ones applied only to Muslims, and then which ones apply to non-Muslims as well. This is just a summary of the, the various uh, sort of clauses of the Medina Charter. But in any case, Prophet Muhammad also had interfaith dialogue with non-Muslims. He invited them, he had good relationships with them, and he even uh, issued agreements or covenants and letters talking about protecting minorities, minority religious communities. And Muslims are commanded to protect the religious freedom of others even till the end of days. There's this specific uh, saying from Prophet Muhammad, who even he, peace be upon him, he said, whoever is cruel and harsh to a non-Muslim minority, curtailing their rights, overburdening them, or stealing from them, I will complain to God about that person on the day of judgment. That's how serious the sort of harsh treatment, the, the cruel oppression uh, of non-Muslim uh, minorities in, in Muslim lands, that's how powerful it is. And there's another specific covenant that where he talked about how he protected, this is to, to Christians, uh, he, I protect Christians wherever they may be on land or sea, in east and west, in north and south. They are under my protection within my covenant and under my security against all harm. And in fact, based on some of these specific teachings and covenants of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the year 2016, sort of modern times, around 300 Muslim scholars, intellectuals, government officials, and more from over 120 countries, they gathered in Marrakesh, Morocco. This was on the specific 1400 year anniversary of the Medina Charter. And the leaders and scholars, they gathered to reaffirm the principles of the Medina Charter, including religious freedom and protecting religious minorities in Muslim majority countries, along with the principles of constitutional contractual citizenship, freedom of movement, property ownership, mutual solidarity and defense, and justice and equality before the law. And they even issued a specific call to action because they recognized that so many Muslim majority countries, unfortunately, were not following the commandments of Prophet Muhammad, the covenants, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and Islam. And you can actually read that full the declaration and call to action that they issued um, at uh, marrakeshdeclaration.org. So you can see the, the reaffirmation of the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and the Medina Charter and its application to our time today. You know, as I've said in previous sessions, Muslims, they don't always do what Islam teaches, just like Christians don't always do what Jesus, peace be upon him, taught. But in this case, we actually do have the conference attendees of the Marrakesh conference, in fact, following the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and the, uh, the specific uh, teachings of Islam. And I'm going to close on one, one specific story that a friend of mine shared, a Jewish friend of mine. He told me one time we were talking. And as, as a, you know, he's Jewish and, and very uh, strong in his faith tradition. And he one time said something that to me that caught my interest. He said, I am so grateful to Muhammad. And I was like, that's interesting. Why? You know, I'm very curious about it. And he said that if it wasn't for Muhammad, my people, the Jewish people may not be alive today. And he was specifically referring to times throughout history in Muslim majority lands where the Muslim rulers did in fact follow Islamic teachings and specifically protected religious minorities, including the Jewish community. And in fact, there are other stories as well of examples throughout Islamic history of different rulers following these teachings and doing what they can to not only protect the religious freedom of, of different communities, and in fact, there are Jewish scholars who really thrived in certain Muslim lands, but also there are examples of sort of beautiful um, uh, relationships. Uh, the, the Sultan and the Saint is a movie, a, a great movie uh, that you can watch if you haven't seen it, about some of the sort of interfaith relationships um, and what happens when people actually follow the teachings of their faith rather than our interests in power, in ego, in, uh, you know, uh, asserting our own sort of uh, desires rather than what our faith traditions may teach us. So with that, I will say thank you so very much.